Well, thank you for being here. I wanted to start this uh, you know, press conference with a note of uh, humor, which, which is deeper also than uh, at first sight. You have seen from Pier Paolo Pasolini this uh, movie from the 60s called Uccellacci e Uccellini, which is an attempt to communicate with birds. And this is an attempt of uh, communication between a human being and an object by Ad Reinhardt, which is a who is the American painter that we you may know, who actually produced sometimes a few you know, drawings like this, commentating his life as an artist. Well, communication between humans and birds, humans and objects, you know, these two images just try to you know, draw the landscape of the 16th Istanbul Bayonio which is a project that started from the meeting of two elements. The first one is a scientific discovery, and the second one is an image. The first one is the fact that we have entered a new um, geological era, which is called the Anthropocene. The name given by scientists to a new era, which is marked by, by the impact of human activities on the planet. And the second, and the second um, element is an image that is actually the pattern for the, the for the 16th Istanbul Bible. Maybe we can show it again. Anthropocene could be called Capitalocene also, because uh, it's our economical choices and the surexploitation of natural resources due to the system, which are, for example, the main cause of global warming. And one of the most visible effects of this situation is the formation of a huge mass of waste called the Seventh Continent, by uh, nicknamed the Seventh Continent. It's three, four point million square kilometers of floating plastic, seven million tons of waste forming an island, actually three islands in three different oceans. That's the seventh continent. And this new continent has, in a way, its own population. It is mainly human, first, because it, it's constituted from our activities, our waste, and their, reflect, their effects on the planet. But it also concerns animals, of course, and vegetables. All the el living elements that are actually living coexisting on this planet, but also technology. So the seventh continent, anthropology of, a, of an off-centered world, is an will be an exhibition uh, which intends to explore <coughs> this new continent. It will explore it as a space of interaction between <coughs> humans, animals, objects and machines. So this exhibition will raise three main questions. The first one is, why calling for this very specific science called anthropology? Just so you, every time a couple of images, this is an artist actually uh, born in Greenland called Pia Arke, who actually passed away um, more than 10 years ago, but the, the work is absolutely fascinating. So why calling for this specific science called anthropology? Because first of all, anthropology is not only a simple field of knowledge. It's more than that. It's a behavior. It's an attitude, I would say. It requires participation, dialogue with the inhabitants, a kind of immersive journey into a civilization. And that's why this model can teach us a lot, actually, and especially when it comes to uh, contemporary art. As the, the British uh, anthropologist uh, Tim Ingold was saying, anthropology is the philosophy with the people in. I really love this definition. It's, which means that it's big on feedback. It doesn't exclude, it doesn't take an object, but it's a relationship between subjects, the, at least that the way it should be. 
This uh, interest for ethnography and anthropology has been shared by many artists in the past, actually. Already in 1975, the, one of the main protagonists of conceptual art, Joseph Kossuth, asserted that art was anthropology, all art was anthropology. In the 1990s, um, the American art critic Al Foster uh, wrote a text called Portrait of the Artist as an Ethnographer. And even more recently, in 2012, the curator Okwi Vezor organized an exhibition in Paris uh, called Intense Proximity, addressing the decrease of distance between countries and cultures as a game changer in art. But our vision of what anthropology is has also changed, and artists are also responsible for this. More recently, um, a new generation of artists is giving much more room to interactions between nature, humans, and technology. Animals, vegetables, machines, algorithms seem to be on the same line than humans and addressed in a kind of choreographic way. I would say um, a new generation of artists is actually working in, towards a kind of choral art, a kind of polyphony of voices. And this is what will interest us most of all in the next Istanbul Biennial, which is uh, also which will leave a lot of room to this new <coughs> generation of artists and uh, whose actually common point might be uh, the fact that art also as a kind of philosophy um, is as Tim Ingold said it's anthropology with the people in uh, but the anthropology they are talking about uh, includes not only human beings but all the non-humans all the living elements that are actually inhabiting this planet we could try to sum up this uh, new uh, um, tendency by saying that contemporary art is inventing a new kind of anthropology that, that I would call a molecular anthropology. What we could define it by saying that it's uh, uh, the studies of all the human effects, all the human tracks, all the human prints in the universe and their interaction with non-humans. So it's a very expanded version of anthropology. And this is, will be the guiding you know, thread throughout the exhibition. Also, there is today a more general awareness, which is the awareness that this very classical division between nature on one side, culture on the other side, which has been, you know, which has sustained Western philosophy, Western thought for more than 2,000 years, has come to an end. It has become completely obsolete. This awareness of the end of the division between nature and culture has generated new approaches to the visible, new dialogues between cultures, new historical narratives, as well also as a new distribution of our ways of thinking. More precisely, new ways to classify the existing beings, new ways to write our history. So this new generation of artists has deeply integrated the idea expressed by the, the French philosopher Michel Serre that, I quote, our ancient cultures opposed culture, which had a, cultures which had a written language to nature, which didn't, while the new culture, the new way of thinking, is embracing cultures which don't have a written language and nature which does. Why? Because every living element on this planet st st stores, uh, emits, processes information. Information is what we all share as human beings and all the other living elements on this planet. So if the seventh continent, which is the title of this exhibition, measures art to anthropology, 
it's an anthropology that cannot anymore be centered upon the human species only. Back in the 1960s, by the way, Claude Lévi-Strauss already saw the ultimate goal of anthropology as the dissolution of the human figure. He was already acknowledging the end of the canonical Western division between nature and culture. And both anthropology and contemporary art embrace now together all those uh, elements, both from animals to machines, from plants to minerals. They reintegrate culture into nature and vice versa. So art tends to become a kind of anthropological inquiry about global life, connecting humans and non-humans and the Anthropocene, uh, the notion of Anthropocene and the ecological you know, uh, warning that it means obviously contributed to this awareness. This Andrea Zittel was working in a desert in uh, Arizona. So the second question is, why talking about the anthropology of this artificial continent, of an off-centered world? First, and this is Agnieszka Kurant, well, the sculptures which are actually here were produced by um, termites. She provided you know, actually the materials to the termites and the termites treat this. The second question is the, the question of the off-centered world. So well, the most important thing is anthropology and art both have to engage and do engage with a multitude of points of views. And way beyond the Western vision of progress, they invent a real perspectivism, to quote the, the name uh, used by the Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro. According to him, the world is composed of a multiplicity of points of view, an infinity of perspectives, and we have to respect them all, not only ours, all of them. Anthropology, as Viveros de Castro has stated, is the theory and practice of permanent decolonization. And this is the second definition of anthropology, which is completing the first one in a very interesting way. So this is another way to formulate the question, what would be a space deprived of any center? And maybe that's the most interesting question today, actually, in the world we live in. Why do we use, why do we need centers? That's a uh, spatial question, but it's an artistic question in a way, by uh, definition. This trans the translation of this question in uh, curatorial terms, <clears throat> because that's the only um, as close as I can approach to the, 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 the um, definition of the exhibition, because we, we won't tell the venues today, later. Um, but I, what I can say only is that the main venue will be um, transformed into a kind of maze. Uh, there will be a path leading the visitor through a series of thematical sequences. So, contemporary art shows the universe as a multiverse, no, not uni, multi. Not a unique point of view guiding all the others, but an archipelago of differences, a kaleidoscope where fragments of different cultures can coexist. Because uh, every nation today is sheltering subcultures, microcultures, fluxes of singularities coming from abroad, migrations, they're all leading to a permanent state of internal recomposition. And we have to acknowledge that. And artists do acknowledge that. Art also includes the beholder and much beyond. It could be described as an anthropological practice embracing alternative communities, minorities, and even sometimes the individual. The individual as species by himself or herself, to quote uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. So this leads us to the third question raised by the 60s Istanbul Biennial, 
but that I fo would formulate this way. What if every artist would be the last survivor of a society that has disappeared, or the last representant of his or her society? That would be an anthropology where every artist would be the savage of every beholder. Savage being the name given by Western colonizers for the people that had a different culture, a different vision of the world. So I suggest that we recuperate this world in a way, in a positive way. Savage then would become the name of the other in general. Every one of you and me, we are all the savages one to another. The following images that you see, Charles Avery, UK artist, and um, you will see later Norman Daly, who's an um, American uh, artist who spent his whole life, actually, he also, uh, it's not made on purpose, but he also passed away <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, he spent his whole life inventing a civilization, the civilization of the Euros, which had, has obviously never existed. Nature has become inseparable from culture, then. And uh, it's the, what the, the French psychoanalyst and philosopher, uh, Félix Guattari, was actually talking about ecosophy. It was the ecology of, uh, not only for nature, but the ecology of the social, the ecology of politics, the ecology of the economics. You know, ecosophy would be an ecological way of thinking concerning all these three elements. And he, he says, he was saying, nature has become inseparable from culture. And if we are to understand the interactions bet between ecosystems, the mechanosphere, the realm of uh, machines, and the social or individual universes, we have to learn to think transversally, <coughs> in diagonals. The proliferation of mutant seaweeds, he was saying, stupid television programs or expropriations of wood neighborhoods in the name of renovation belong to a single issue, he was saying, that of pollution. Sorry, pollution. <laughs> <laughs> if we follow this reasoning, <clears throat> the importance taken by natural elements, machine and objects in contemporary art may well be perceived as a form of resistance towards this devastation, towards the vacuum, I quote Guattari again, created by an age in which the accelerating production of material and immaterial goods is both absurd and increasing, increasingly irremediable. It threatens both individual <coughs> and group existential territories. It's an ecological problem and desertification, uh, to dwell uh, on Felix Guattari's words, concerns not only the landscape, but also the human brain. The same way the city of Istanbul has been historically the passage, the metaphorical passage between East and West, I would like this exhibition to uh, attempting, trying to be a kind of gateway between different worlds, nature and culture, anthropology and art, and the world invented by artists, and yours. I would like to thank uh, the artists who are actually here, hidden in the, in the room, you know, <laughs> in the research trip. Özle Maltin, uh, Thiago Rochapita, Marie Dance, And I would like to thank also uh, and uh, all the team members of the Istanbul Bino, which are really doing a fantastic job, and uh, I think we will uh, you know, see each other very soon, in September 2019. Well, at least. Thank you very much.